the Atlanta History Center. Today is August 19, 2004, and I'm going to now introduce our interviewee. And George, tell us your name, uh, your date of birth, and your place of birth, if you will. I'm George Goodwin. I was born in Atlanta on June 20, 1917. I fall most of my life here. I was away from um, 1940 through 45, but uh, otherwise been, been here in a Tell me a little bit about your growing up in West End and your family. Well, West End was a very pleasant place to grow up. At, uh, time of my earliest memories, which would be the early 1920s. Atlanta was still a quite compact place, and um, there weren't an awful lot of automobiles, so you walked most places you needed to go, some road bicycles. And, uh, there weren't many two-car families, at least not on the southwest side of town. But uh, it was a good area to get around because it wasn't too big. One of the things that gets overlooked in Atlanta's history right now, it seems to me, is that they overlook the geography of the place. There, um, I was looking at the 25 largest metropolitan areas in the cycle, in the Omanac. And of them, I think 18 are on water, which means that you have other than a circular pattern. A circular pattern for an American city is damned rare. Columbus, Ohio has one. In fact, there's a lot of similarities between Atlanta and Columbus. But generally, we, we overlook that because with a linear pattern, things get strung out. But with a circular pattern, even if they get off balance in one direction, as we did, I think, in the 80s and 90s, uh, certainly the first half of the 90s, to the north and northwest. Since that time, you'll notice it's been coming back up in Henry County and uh, around Newman. That side of the town. So it's not unlike the plate that the clown has its surface. It eventually evens itself. Uh, I have an idea that that geography has a tremendous impact, particularly on a circular city. You think about the other ones, um, the New Yorks, the Bostons, the Mississippi River cities, the Great Lakes city. Not only are they other than circular, usually an arc, sometimes a linear thing is on the west coast because it both gets the mountains pretty quick. Um, but from its earliest days, the water-oriented industries tend to dominate. Shipping, fishing, warehousing, that type of thing. Uh, just the basic idea of being a way to get there and the reception functions around the port of a dock or, or docks or whatever it is. Um, brings an economic difference as well as a, um, an historical difference. Geographic yeah. definition. And um, I've begun to suspect that geography shapes history. But certainly For instance, uh, in Atlanta with the train. Yeah. But think about other, think about other cities, <coughs> European cities. Um, there had to have been a city where Paris is, because that was the island there in the Seine. 
made it easy to, to get to it across the river. The Thames at London uh, is pretty full at London, but beyond that, it begins to drop down to almost a triple, relative triple. And so, yeah, if that headwaters, something had to happen. Houston, the headwaters down there in Texas. And of course, the Mississippi River and the Great Lakes. Uh, uh, Denver's an example. Denver's at the foot of a mountain. That uh, an awful lot of people had to refresh or refurbish or rebuild or do something before they went over that mountain. And uh, so you've got a fairly level Denver, but then a sharp descent immediately behind it. And it influences the bound, it's a boundary. It influences yes. the growth. Uh, what was yeah. the connection between West End when you were a boy and the city of Atlanta? Uh, well, what was your memory of back Back up a little bit further. Atlanta is established. Stephen Long drove his stake here in uh, 1837, incidentally and parenthetically, and you got to put up with my wandering. Uh, I was reading in a book called The Great West, a fairly large book, it came on the name of Stephen Long, who was a something of a figure in the West of of the early 1800s. And they say he left and went back east and was never heard from again. Well, he went back to go to work for a railroad. And the next thing he did was drive the state around which Atlanta was built. But this guy was writing about the west. So when he went away, he was dead. <laughs> but Long was really a vital factor. In fact, somebody or some publication asked me to do a piece back away as what I thought was the most significant happening in it, Mama. And I thought a long time. I went over all of Garrett. I even got the manuscript for the third volume of Garrett. I went through it. And finally made some lists and sort of that. I kept coming back that the most important thing about Atlanta was that Stephen Long drove his stake in the right place. And, uh, they needed to survey that river crossing to yes. bring the railroad from Chattanooga across the Chattahoochee. And it really, I think, is where the granite ridges aligned that marked that spot. Yeah, and also the direction to um, from whoever was giving it to him, Stephen Long, was to put it south of the Chattahoochee River, which presumes that the state was going to pay for building the bridge. Not the first thing we jumped on the state of Georgia, <laughs> but on the other hand, the state's dumped a good many things on us, so I guess it's all right. But um, back to what it was like growing up in West End, why I went into that dry tribe about the circle. Oh. The first city limits of Atlanta were a mile circle from the state once it was removed. It was removed a little bit from all around Marietta Street to where it is now. And uh, then the second expansion of the city limits was the second mile. And thereafter it began to wander in all directions. Uh, but um, that second mile tended to include West End, the 10th Street area, Little Five Points. And uh, they were rural sinners all themselves. Now, at the time of my earliest rec recollection, it's a metropolitan area of about 300,000. Decatur is out there, although it predated Atlanta just a little bit. Um, and it, of course, has become a part of the pie and fills in that um, eastern side. But uh, you got those, and then again, going back to the circle thing, 
The thing about it today, you got that pattern of cities again in a circle. Gainesville, Newman, around that way. Uh, so, being in West End was not an isolated life. The, uh, the streetcars were there, and they were quite efficient. Uh, so you could get one in front of our house on what was then Gordon Street, and it's now right Ralph David Abernathy, a boulevard. And you could be downtown in 15 minutes. And I'm sure that was equally true from 10th Street or from uh, Inman Park. So everything was kind of equal distant out there. And so it was all pretty much tied together. In 1872, when the town moved to rebuild, or, or maybe to start for the first time, its uh, school system, um, they, they concentrated things pretty much into the center for the girls' high school and the boys' high school. and. Um, I think there was a discussion about that time, whether they'd be together or apart. Prove it to one, I guess. And um, the fact that they were kind of in the middle, and we all were crisscrossing, brought the whole community pretty much together. Oh, the, uh, when I was in high school, which was from 32 to graduation in 35. Um, the meeting place was Alabama and what was then Whitehall Street. It's now South Peach Street, which never struck me as making much sense. But um, all the uh, boys' high and tech high specials came there, and the girls' high specials, which were a little bit of quality, uh, came there too. And, just a general milling around, but everybody has got to know each other. Tell me what your parents did in Atlanta. What sort of well, work? Did they work in the city? Yes. Uh, actually, I had, in effect, four parents. My father and mother were married in, uh, I believe it was 1915. I came along in 1970. Tell me their names. My mother's name was Carrie Clark from uh, Waxhaw, North Carolina. She was one of a large family. And she came down here to live with her next eldest sister, who had married a man named Ben Burgess, who had come from uh, North Georgia, Northeast Georgia, in Currahee Mountain. And, um, his mother and Aunt Anna had grown up in, in Waxhaw. And at first, Aunt Anna and Uncle Ben lived in Charlotte, although he was from Atlanta, and fairly soon they moved down here, and when they did, Mother came with them. And Mother wanted to be independent, so she uh, learned to use a switchboard, a telephone switchboard. And, uh, I think she may have worked briefly for the telephone company, but whether she did or she didn't, uh, very early on, she uh, went to the spectacular new luxury apartment that was being built here called the Postelian Apartment, at Peachtree and um, Postelian, a curved front building. And uh, it was there that she met my father, who was selling uh, fire extinguishers. He was a salesman. His whole life was kind of oriented to sales. He, he sold fire extinguishers, later fire um, engines, fire apparatus, and uh, in between locks and hardware. So he was away. I remember he was, I'd see him in uh, Christmas time, and we'd usually vacation together, he and mother and I. What was his name? His name was George E. Goodwin. I'm a junior. And uh, he had come from uh, Edenton, North Carolina, and was an orphan. His, both 
both his parents had died. Well, I think his mother died in childbirth. I believe he was the third of three sons. There were no girls in that family. And um, so he was on his own pretty much all his life. Uh, and as I say, fell into the sales field. He was in Miami and South Florida at the time of the boom of 1925, 26. Um, it's interesting that he was here the year you were born uh, was the year of the great fire of Atlanta. That's correct. Given his line of work, did he tell you stories about that? No, but my mother did. She recalls and that. And I will have you know that I was uh, at that fire. Because mother was running the Postelian apartment. And she went up on the roof to uh, see what the world was going on up there. And of course, the fire is sweeping just east of them, uh, from down around Grady Hospital up to across Ponce de Leon Avenue, though it didn't do much damage north of Ponce de Leon Avenue. And uh, she stood up there and watched it. And she was eight months pregnant with the only child she had. So I've always had a sort of a kinship for, for that fire. And then later in my life, to have been involved in the Weinkauf fire, which was certainly our second um, I don't know what it is, problematic or something. But anyway, uh, going back to growing up in West End, uh, the West End Shopping Center was pretty much the center of buying things. Mother was a great walker, and she walked up to West End, which is a mile from our house, further out Gordon Street. And, um, arm full of groceries and walk back. I remember one day we were walking past the uh, George Allen Harris home, the Rensman, and she said, now that's a library. If you go there, they will lend you a book, and if you take care of it, they'll lend you another one. And that's how I became interested in the Atlanta Public Library System, and I've been involved with it uh, most of my life, one way or another. Um, just had, they just had one room dedicated to the branch library. But for me, it was a very important room. I began to use it, certainly, as soon as I was seven years old, and perhaps when I was only six. Um, but I recall the first day of school, we didn't have kindergarten or preschool at that time. Kindergarten was coming in some areas, but we didn't. I went to George Sandler Harris uh, Elementary School out on Lucille Avenue. We were almost exactly on the dividing line between People Street, which was to the east of us, and uh, George Sandler Harris, which was sort of uh, to the northwest a little bit. Um, but it was walking distance from our home at the corner of, or ne next door to the corner of Holderness and Gordon. And she walked me over there the first day, and thereafter, age six, I'm supposed to do it all by myself. I did, and uh, very early on, a friend of mine was selling magazines, primarily the Saturday Evening Post, but also the Atlanta Journal, the uh, Ladies' Home Journal, and a thing called the Country Gentleman, Curtis Publishing Company, maybe. And, um, I developed a, a route down through West End, which you did by walking with two bags on either side, cross, cross straps in front of you. And um, every Thursday, you went around your route, selling the Saturday evening post and getting a nickel for each copy. And you developed some fairly regular customers there. They were all, always quite nice, nice folk. Just a pleasant experience all the way around. Uh, later, after I was up to the, I guess the sixth grade in elementary school and on through the three grades of junior high, seven, eight, and nine in those days, uh, I sold magazines downtown. And, uh, 
became the branch agent. My aunt actually did most of the activity. We had a nice back porch, and the little boys, kids in the magazines from us could come up, and I think I got a half cent on each one of those. Or something. And um, so she sort of ran that part of things. And I re recall, um, we didn't have salesmen who'd do 12 to 20 copies of the post a week. And then in one week, two kids showed up. And they racked up 60 to 75 copies. I'm reasonably sure that one of them was true at Kathy. Um, my Chick fil A fame. And the other was Ashley Verlander, who became a major citizen, a most significant citizen for Jacksonville. And. Um, they were just so much beyond anything we'd ever known that uh, we were right proud of their accomplishments and Rick made a few cents off them as well. But that sales function, and my father had an office uh, downtown in the old Red Rock building, and so that could sort of serve as a base for him. And so I would get down there and then operate around what was the Hidden Gritty office building, some of the other office buildings. Some of them wouldn't let you in, some of them threw you out if you found you in. But, uh, again, you developed contacts, but in me, it, it aroused a particular affection for Atlanta, for downtown. And the, what I always sort of found was the general excitement of downtown Atlanta. Now, keep in mind that I'm talking about the late 20s and the early 30s. And downtown was strictly, strongly segregated, racially. There was Auburn Avenue. There was one uh, black barber shop on Peach uh, Street Street. Near Owen, like where Owen comes into it. And everything else was white. And so you just lived in that pattern. And having grown up in it, you didn't have any reason to question it. Looking back, you wonder that it didn't explode in revolution way, way back. And when it finally did begin to change, it changed pretty harmoniously, certainly around Atlanta, as in contrast with Little Rock and some of the other southern cities, particularly the, uh, the old cotton town. And then, as I said earlier, in those days, you, there were junior highs, Joe Brown, O'Keefe, Bass, and later Matt Maddox and Murphy. Where was your junior high school? On uh, People Street, again within walking distance of my home, about two blocks, three blocks maybe, from Gordon. And there was a back way up there. Uh, incident of the back way was in part along the old um, Beltline Railroad, which has become rather topical since. And so was the way that I walked to Joel Chandler Harris Elementary School, partly along the bank of that railroad. In fact, I fell down it one day. And um, it was just a very pleasant, placid way of life. Were you beginning to develop career interests in your junior high and high school days? In my junior high, I, uh, again, the Atlanta public school system I thought it was pretty good, and looking back, I think it was quite good. Willis A. Sutton was superintendent of school during most of the time I was coming along. I remember patting me on the head when I was a little boy. Uh, and he was still around when I was at uh, Joe Brown, I think he was a boy, so. Um, but one of the purposes 
Texas, Virginia, was to help people think through possible vocational destination. They had, I thought, very comprehensive shops, printing, carpentry, metalwork, mechanical drawing. And uh, in the eighth grade, you were supposed to do a career book, well, some career. I did mine in law, so I don't know why, but it seemed like a nice genteel business. People got rich in it. And uh, so then, at the same time, we had from the fourth grade on something called the Bixel Spelling Test. If you do many interviews with me at Leonard's, you're going to hear about the Bixler spelling test. Horace Hinch Bixler was an assistant superintendent of the school. And all students met his test, I think, first in the fourth grade. And you took it in the fall and in the spring. hundred words drawn from about 5,000 words. Well, spelling was not and is not my strong suit. I used to tease me at the journal that I had to have a copy editor just to do my spelling. But um, it really was. I'd make grades like 25, 30, 42. Uh, and study, Lord, I studied the damn stuff. Even today, certain words, words like prairie, squirrel, other well, fairly common words will, will trip me up. So I live with a dictionary over my shoulder in the arm. And uh, lo and behold, in the fall of my senior, junior high year, that would be my the ninth grade, I passed the test. I had 70. And so one of my friends said, well, what are you going to do with the two extra hours you have that you don't have to go to spelling class? Because until you pass the test, you have to take spelling. Yes, that was evidence that spelling was perhaps not teachable. But anyway, I said, I don't know. He said, well, why don't you come into Miss Creel's journalism class? And I said, well, why not? I didn't have anything better to do. Miss Creel had just graduated from Emory. She was probably 22 or 23, brown-eyed blonde. And so in two weeks, I did go into the class for the second semester. In two weeks, I'd absolutely fallen in love with journalism, and to a degree with Miss Creel. And we maintained our friendship until she died uh, about, I guess it's five years ago. And I saw her in the year before she died. She was a librarian and a senior citizen somewhere. Just as bright and bouncy as she always was. But we'd have telephone conversations maybe every quarter or so or something like that. I kept track of her and I guess she kept track of me. But I really was uh, fell into exactly the right place. Because you could always find somebody else to do your spelling. But I was pretty good at learning what was going on and then conveying it. And most of my life, well, I guess all of it, has reflected that basic function. Um, after graduating from uh, WNL, I came back to Atlanta and went to work work in the newspaper business in the old Atlanta, Georgia. The Hearst, and, Hearst paper. paper. And um, I started there, well, I, I graduated in June, and I think on a Thursday. I don't know, Friday, I uh, went down to the uh, Georgian where I had done an internship the year before, and W.S. Kirkpatrick was managing editor. And um, he said, well, you did pretty well last year 
about, uh, and we'd like to have you, but we don't have a place for you. We have some friends. We're going out to uh, California on the Georgia, uh, the Southland camps. I've been out three years before with the Georgia Caravan. Those were long vacation trips where you kept camped out about eight weeks. You really could do the West in eight weeks. And um, so I came back, went back down to see Mr. Kirk. And he said, same song, second verse. I still don't have a place. Well, one of the reporters died the next day, and I went to work on the following two. What year? 1939. The Hearst paper, the Atlanta Georgian, didn't last that much longer, did it? Tell me about it. Look, I've worked on five newspapers that no longer exist. Uh, but the Georgian um, was a great paper to be on. Kirk Patrick was a great man to work for. And so it, uh, it closed on, um, I think it was December 17th. Our last big story was the Gone with the Wind um, premiere of 1939. And, uh, Did you personally witness some of those events? Yes, I was a feature writer in the main, and so I, uh, I got involved in, in most of them. Uh, I remember doing um, a long interview one time with Olivia de Havilland. And, uh, well, I guess I did that in the, in the summer before I came back to the paper, or came to the paper, because that was the trip where I met her. Our fraternity, uh, Mother Washington Lee, had sort of raised her and her sister. And so I think came about. And I remember when she announced she was coming to the premiere, I did a telephone interview with her then. And then later, I was part of the staff at Coach. We usually, like the Hearst pattern, would usually throw more than one person into a significant story. Um, sometimes as many as five or six. And fortunately, we had a great rewrite man, William O. Key Jr., who incidentally wrote one of the better books about the Atlanta campaign. Um, Key was a pretty hard drinking guy, but he was a great rewrite. When the wine caught fire, we had at least five people feeding into Key. And he was getting the paragraphs in order and moving out a meaningful story all the time. And that story was running from about 2 o'clock in the morning to a certain midday, mid-afternoon. Was that what newspaper? By that time, I was back on the, I was on the old long jump, or on the long Newspapering in Atlanta was fun because, um, again, things went on here. You didn't have any single industry domination. It wasn't a cotton town. Finance was highly significant. The banks had a great deal to do with running things. Uh, but um, it was a fairly small group of decisions. And that continued until quite recently. But um, anyway, that fall, um, I worked on the Georgian, and then it closed, and I went to Charleston, South Carolina, and the News and Courier. And from there to Washington, and the Washington Times Herald. And on the Times Herald, I was assigned to City Hall. So my interest in urban affairs began to emerge, as well as my interest in feature writing. And covering the District of Columbia was a pretty interesting thing in those days. 
because it was surely the best municipal government in America. And the Times Herald then was run by Sissy Patterson. I made it pretty clear that one of my assignments was to make it look bad whenever I could. And that sort of wore on me because it really was a good system, an effective system. The commissioners, three of them, were appointed by the Congress or by the President. One of them was the engineer commissioner. Or why did he be an engineer? One of the people I worked with is a reporter. Well, no, this man was not working with him as a reporter. He was a commissioner then. But he had been a reporter earlier, covering the White House. And he kept needling President Roosevelt. But when was he going to fill the vacancy on the District of Columbia Commission? And so one day Roosevelt looked at him and said, I've decided who it's going to be. And he grabs his pencil. Who? You! Who was that? I have forgotten his name at the moment. I'm just trying to bring it back. But uh, so this was your period on the, about five years away from Atlanta. More than that, uh, at least for, for the first, for the second time, because um, that was before World War II. Uh, in the spring of 1941, my wife and I. We had met in, in uh, Washington just shortly after I got there to work on the Times Herald. Tell me her name. Lois Milstead, better known as Skippy. And um, it was a fairly fast romance. We met in June and were married in November 1940. So in 41, we vacationed in the spring in, in Miami. And some of the old Atlanta Georgian crowd had reassembled there. So I dropped by to see him. Jimmy Burns was city editor. And um, he said, why don't you come down and work with us? As I said, I was getting a little unhappy about the special assignment on the Times Herald, making the government look better, trying to. And so um, we looked at each other and said, why not? So Jimmy said, well, just be sure you get here before the first hurricane. So we went down there, and I think we got there about three days before the first turn. And uh, but that was the Miami Daily News, and that was my first encounter with Governor Cox. Well, he spent his winters down there, and his office was up on top of the building where the news was. And he followed, followed the news pretty damn closely. And all of us sort of feared we would call up one, one day he called and I answered the phone and he said, what's going on? And I looked around and I said, I haven't any idea. <laughs> but he had a sense of humor and uh, he was a great, great guy, he really was. So I was working there until I went in the Navy in November of 1943. And again, I was primarily doing feature stories. And Miami and Miami Beach is a great place to do feature stories in the wintertime because at that time people were not vacationing as much in Europe. There weren't as many cruises. Even the Caribbean was uh, an unexpected place for one to go to. You went to California, you went to Florida for vacation. So a lot of interesting people came by and did various pieces. service somewhere and I didn't want to walk so I applied first to the FBI and they didn't want to part of me and then to the Navy and the Navy was looking for ex-newsmen and uh, lawyers. Strange combination. But um, anyway I, I filled the requirement and went in in November my commission actually came 
1890, in December, but I, that's the month of November of 1943, or 42, uh, as a civilian agent in the intelligence side of the nation. They're in Miami. And then my orders came through in early December. That uh, led to my naval career, which lasted almost three years, two of which were overseas. But again, it was the same function. I was an operational intelligence officer. It was doing for just a more restricted audience than what a newspaper reporter does. Find out what's going on, tell somebody about it. And um, it was a very pleasant uh, career. You documented your military career in a Another interview, yeah. I and I'll, I, not to pass over that important yeah. point in your life, but I'm curious to know now as you leave the military, do you come back to Atlanta? Yes, I'll touch on this one thing, so we won't have a complete hiatus here. But uh, my naval career, once it got going, was that of intelligence officer for most torpedo boat squadrons, PT boats. And again, it's the same damn function. You interview the guys that go out on patrol on Monday to tell the guys that are going out on Tuesday what they might expect. And, uh, you read the documents and get the benefit of prison interrogations from other places and pass them out to the guys in your squadron. And some of that works. But after the uh, war, I came back home from the uh, Philippines on one of the jeep carriers. Got into uh, San Diego, and I remember. And I'll always have an affection for San Diego, even though we're having some very really intense ball games with them this week. Um, because as we came in, there was a small sign on the side of the channel. Welcome home. And uh, I think everybody on that damn carrier appreciates it. So I've always had a sort of a warm spot in my heart for San Diego. And then on back home and with my wife, she has been my naval time either in our home city of Dalvin, Virginia. My father had the most fascinating, if I may get into a parenthesis here, my father had one of the most fascinating jobs. He was a senior civilian at the Naval Proving Ground at Dalvin, Virginia. And he personally fired every U.S. naval rifle of eight inches and above. I was with him when he fired the guns of New Jersey. I think that's why Skippy doesn't react too unpleasant as a noise. She grew up around it. But they, they'd fire those 16 inch shells down the Potomac. And those shells were expected to go through a wire ring. And that ring wasn't much bigger than this room. And if it didn't, something was wrong. And the brewing ground was there to find out why it was. remarkable guy. We, we got along wonderfully well together. He died while I was on the way home. Forty-five. But um, we went on down to Miami. Walked in. Hope Welch, who had been with me on the old Georgian. Then when I was first in Miami, I think he was sports editor then. And, um, oh no, he was managing it. And he's jumped up and welcomed me. He said, your typewriter's waiting for you and you got a 10% raise. I said, Hoke, is that by any chance the same raise the elevator operator got? He said, yeah. I said, well, let me think about this a little bit. Because I've been, uh, been away three years. I was three years old. Uh, certainly more experienced and sure had better judgment than I had three years before. 
And uh, while I was in Atlanta, we were visiting our family here, mother, my aunt, and uncle. Uh, my father then was in North Carolina. And um, I had gone to the general, and Kirk Patrick was, had become managing editor general. And he said, if you don't like it down in uh, Miami, give me a call. I think he knew what had gone on. This is Don Rooney at the Atlanta History Center. It's August 19, 2004, and we're continuing our conversation with George E. Goodwin. We've just been talking about your meeting with Kirkpatrick at the Atlanta Journal um, and yes. your continuing career just after World War II. Yes. So, as I was saying, uh, came back to Atlanta from the Philippines and uh, stopping here, I went by the Atlanta Journal to see my friend Davy S. Kirkpatrick, who at that time had become managing editor of the Journal. He had been managing editor of the Atlanta Georgia during my internship and brief stay there in 1938 and then my stay in 1939 until the Georgian was sold. So he had told me if I didn't like what I saw in Miami, I'd give him a call. So I called him and he said, come on back. He said, I can't pay you any more than they would, but I can look after you and I'll have control of the future. And so we did. We, we drove right on back to it now. And I went and see him. This would have been in mid-December of 45. And it finally worked out that I started, I think, right 1st of January, 1946. Maybe even a day or so in 45 or no more. And the assignment was City Hall, which was the City Hall of Hartsville. And City Hall was a great assignment, a great beat, partly because everything that happened in the morning virtually everything, unless council was meeting or a particularly important committee of council was meeting in the afternoon. So you had the afternoons pretty much to work on other stories. So I wasn't confined just to urban affairs, but I uh, spent most of my time there. In fact, you the pattern was you really didn't go to the office no more, you went to City Hall. And then you'd get into the office somewhere in the early afternoon, maybe 1 2 o'clock, something like that, and still have several hours where you could work on other things or you could polish up what was left over from the morning. It was a very pleasant way to work. We had beat men and Fulton County Courthouse, Atlanta City Hall, the State Capitol, the um, so-called Federal Beat, which was several of the federal offices in town, and of course police. So um, it was possible to get around, it was possible to be assigned sometimes to one, one that wasn't really your own. We were talking about the development of Atlanta. And I remember one day I was covering City Hall. And I think it was probably 1950. I left the journal in 54 or 52. I was to head up what's now Central Atlanta Progress. Well, I think it was 1950. The city had the call, said, go and cover the capital. And I did, and the coverage of the Capitol was a little different from City Hall, and City Hall, the Constitution man and the general man competed to a degree, but at the Capitol, everything was pretty much open, and the reporters would walk around together. Fairly consistent pattern. You'd stop by the governor's office, and if he was in, you might have a word with him, or you'd certainly have some words with his administrative assistant. 
And you go on around some other department heads, and one that was always on the list was a state auditor, because he was a very bright guy and he beat me straight. And I recall on this particular day we went in, what's going on? Well, he said, I may have a little, a little piece for you today. Pricked up our head. What's that? He said, we just completed the property tax digest for the state of Georgia. And it's back to where it was in 1860. Think about that. If you don't believe that the Depression in the South lasted from Appomattox to Pearl Harbor, just think about that spread. Later, I was to have it emphasized when I was vice president in charge of advertising and public relations for the First National Bank. Uh, a young fella came to work for us, uh, either between the Navy and college, or college and the Navy, I've forgotten which. I asked him to, to do the history of First National, Stan Walkovy of Georgia. And he did a very thorough job, Jerry Horton, who later was a member of the legislature. And he researched all of the four precedent banks of First National. And the earliest one was the Atlanta National Bank, which was opened in September, I believe, of 1864, excuse me, 1865. But it was the first bank opened under the Banking Act, the National Banking Act of 1864. So even today, Wachovia of Georgia has on all its checks the, the code 64-1. And um, that bank gets going in September of 1865, four months or so after Appomattox. And it was 10 years for that bank, which was the largest bank in the second largest city in the South, had a million dollars on the project. And it was 1917, the year that I was born, before it had $10 million on the project. Now you think about bank sizes and billions. And in other parts of the country, they were certainly thinking about them in, uh, bigger things than one to ten million. But if one needed anything to emphasize his belief that the South was in a very, very long depression. Now it didn't just get going in October of 1929. It had been stretched out and continued to stretch out through the 30s and going to the beginning of World War II. And I think a lot of Atlanta historians tend to overlook that. I know I got carried away once and never did really finish what I was trying to do. I was trying to find out where the money came from to rebuild Atlanta after the burning of 1864. And you can account for some of it. There was a small bond issue, uh, but nobody had much money to pay taxes to have more than a very small. The railroads either were owned out of the South or they had such big loans out of the South. I think some of the money to restore them and to restore the railroad properties and warehouses, terminals, that sort of thing, may have come from the outside, although I couldn't really prove it. Someday if you've got a bright young intern, you won't have to do something. That seems to be something well worth digging into. Just where did the money come from? We know that all of the Atlanta banks, or practically all of them, had roots in East Tennessee. 
people who had been in East Tennessee came down here after the war and were involved in starting banks. That may be because Tennessee didn't have the problem we did. But um, that's a good question. He goes back, as does that question of the circular pattern. Has anybody ever really thoroughly dug into what the implications of this are? And we write about events, but very few of the books relate one event to another. I think Rick Allen wrote probably the best history of the mind that I know. There have been others that have been quite good, and one or two quite bad. I think one of the things that spoiled Atlanta history books was Franklin Garrett because he was so thoroughly thorough in his two volumes. And then in the third volume, which is a story all by itself, which you ought to get Brad Rice to tell you sometime, um, the same pattern is carried forward. This is Harold Martin's. Yeah, work. Harold Martin was doing it, and uh, Brad was in charge of it. Brad told Harold he wanted, um, I forget what it was now, less than a thousand pages. He came in with 1,600. And so Brad had the job of editing Harold Martin, which is something I would never want to do. Incidentally, I, I worked with Harold uh, through much of my newspaper career because he was on the old Georgian when I was there. He was the star reporter on the Georgian. And uh, then he was still on the Journal when I got back. He, he used to say that Harold and I could ride to Macon and I would sack out in the hotel and he'd write the three feature stories he saw on the way. He had a wonderful eye for features. He had a great voice to the industry. How well, you was, better get us back on the how track. How was Atlanta different when you came back after the war? You, uh, it you, was larger. Pointed yourself in a new position, your, you and your wife moved back to Atlanta. Tell me a little bit Atlanta. about your life back in Atlanta and your work. Well, we had, by that time, my parents were fully divorced. My father was living in Charlotte. My mother was living with her sister and her sister's husband. And so we came back to town. We had lived in apartments after we were married in Arlington, Virginia. We'd had a small house in Miami. And uh, we were sort of shelter hunting in the last week of 1945 and January of 46. Finally found a, a, an upstairs apartment in a frame, fairly good sized house on Lawton Street, just off Gordon Street, now Ralph David Abernathy Boulevard, in West End. No more than five or six blocks from where I had grown up, although I was actually, my family was actually living on Lee Street when we were married. I mean, when I was born. But uh, I think I was about five when we moved to, to Gordon, so my Lee Street memories are not very substantial, but everything from Gordon Street on is subject to the tricks memory plays on you, and believe me, when you get to my age, it does. 